Hey there guys, gals, and those in between. It's Common Gamer, and we're back with the sequel to Saga Frontier 1 called, well, Saga Frontier 2. So as usual, sit back, relax, have a beverage of your choice, as we head on down to discover, is Saga Frontier 2 worth it? Well, let's find out. To start with, I have no nostalgic connection to this game at all. Frontier 1 was just one of those odd games I just happened to have for my PS1 that I can't really remember how I got it and I spent many days after school just playing it. So Frontier 2 was a fresh experience for me overall. A fresh experience and a shorter experience, and thank god for that. Don't get me wrong, I love Frontier 1, but doing a 50 minute video by oneself is not a cakewalk. Square may have felt the same way because it seems that Frontier 2 takes a safer approach, and work started as soon as Frontier 1 ended, with Kawazu, the series lead, both producing and co-writing this game. Having a similar development window of two or so years, the game benefited from two major points. The first is that Frontier 1 was early in Square making games for the PlayStation, and as we've noted here many times, you can see a clear difference between the start of a console cycle and the end. Just look at Final Fantasy 7 to 9, and one can see a marked difference in everything from character models, backgrounds, attack animations, and well, everything. The reason's obvious, there's more time to better understand the nuances of this new system you're working on. The second thing of course is not having 7 different character stories and arcs. Jesus, I love Frontier 1, but lord was it ambitious. It feels like the series head Kawazu knew that, since for Frontier 2, the number of stories is down from 7 to merely 2, and one can even argue it's really just one large story. This works because as you may recall, my issue with the first was that some of the stories were amazing, with many encompassing different tones of coming of age tales, film noir inspired escapades, and superhero dramatics. And then others were like, get a job, kill the guy who killed your dad, I guess, whatever. With just two stories here, it's a lot more concise, carrying a more even tone throughout the game. Of the two main characters throughout your playthrough, the first is Gustav, the banished prince of a kingdom. On the day of his ascension, he is supposed to wield the fabled sword known as the Firebrand. The sword denies him and he is deemed worthless by his father. Having no anima or magical power as it's called here, it is decreed that he is not fit for the throne, and thus he is exiled from the kingdom, his mother coming in tow, refusing to doom her child to a fate without her. A prince, now considered in some parts less than human because of his inability to harness magic. Gustav's Chronicle will be a story of defying societal expectations, proving that even if one is considered trash, perhaps if they use what skills they do possess, they can go and carve out a place of their own in this world, and maybe even possibly saving the world. Your other character will be Will Knight, someone with rather simple and rustic beginnings. He lives with his aunt and uncle, and he makes his money as a digger, getting items called quells that never break so that he can sell. Following a lead, he discovers that a certain quell is responsible for the death of his mother and father, a quell simply called the Egg. A mysterious quell that enhances one's anima, but causes the user to grow mad and leaves tragedy and death in its wake. Will will make his place in the world, but all the while he will always be looking for this egg that killed his parents. It is an oath he takes so that no one suffers as he does. It is a quest that will be undertaken not only by him, but also his children and beyond. A tale of vengeance and happenstance involving what may be this world's oldest enemy and may decide the fate of every living being. You might have noticed, but family seems to be a central core of this game. Gustav abandoned by one, and Will never really knowing his parents. As we spoke of Will's kids, the stories take place over literal decades, and you can see as some of your characters age as you play through those decades. So it's more fair to call it the Knights family scenario and the Gustav family scenario. While both starting out as different as can be, one's royalty, the other's not, and tonally they're around night and day, both stories though play to a larger narrative that intertwines near the end, and for the most part they stay separated from one another. Mine is two specific points. But again, because they play to a much larger and grandiose tale, I feel that it does a better job in that regard than the first game. But that's subjective really. It doesn't take a keen eye to notice that Frontier 2 looks markedly different from the first. The first one was more of a technical marvel, though I do feel like it faltered in the art direction not fully utilizing its sci-fi settings, minus a few great points of course. The second opts for a more simplistic but effective look. Sometimes you don't have to reinvent the wheel. Sometimes something more traditional can be just as good if it's made well. And I do really think the use of watercolors as an artistic choice are a sight to behold. 
Not only do the backdrops work really well with the sprites, but the choice of colors they use adding to the storybook feel of this adventure and fitting the overall tone of the game. Knights, magic, sorceries, kings, princes, the whole nine. So it's a safe choice, but one that works well within the parameters of the game. If this is a finished painting, the first is more of a collage, a little bit of everything. Coming of age stories, tokusatsu stories, film noir detective parts about clearing your name, deep sci-fi lores with antagonists dating back millions of years. This one again just goes with a safe story about kings, kingdoms, and ancient enemies. If you have a tingling sensation because this game seems familiar but not really, you might be thinking of Legend of Mana. And that's because Kawazu helped produce that game around the same time. It's an art style I really like and wish was used more, though I can understand how difficult that can be. And this is no way an old man yelling at clouds going, mm, darn kids, they got good graphics and nothing else. Where is the art, I tell ya? And where's my dentures? I've played plenty of modern games that were great experiences with amazing art direction. Though I've also played modern games where it can be best surmised as, yeah, I think the graphics were good, I was just looking at walls for most of it so I can't really tell. I'm sure someone's also gonna say games like Bastion exist and that there were plenty of butt ugly PS1 games that had no real art direction besides Building A, Building B, Building C, but at nights. And if you saw pictures of them, you couldn't really recall what game they were from. Frontier 2, just from the background itself, is something that will be ingrained in my memory for years. I'll even remember the overworld map. It's here where you can select where to go next, as opposed to the first game where you just went to a travel agency and picked from a list. You'll also see a nice little blurb about each and every country. It's a small thing, but I really feel like it's those tiny things that add up to make a game great. And how often can you see an overworld map and be like, yeah, I know where that's from. It really does make me a bit sad, I feel like with older generations of games that the major developers were more experimental with their graphics, and now that kind of falls to the indie guys. I can see why the major guys don't do it, it can be a huge pain to be like, okay, so all the backgrounds are gonna be a painting, yeah? Each screen is going to be an individual canvas that we're gonna draw ourselves, and the rest, sprites, monsters, all gonna be hand-drawn, scanned, and digitized. So if we change things up and need a new area, we'll just paint an entirely new area. Yeah, it's kind of insane when you think about it, but it was worth it because again, it's memorable and it sticks out from the pack. Sadly, I can't say the same about the music, and this is no way a dig at Masashi, who was a vet in the industry, though at the time, this was only his fourth game. And again, the man is amazing. As one of like, 10 people who like Final Fantasy XIII and feels it gets an unnecessary amount of hate, because it has the Final Fantasy name attached to it, even the most ardent critics have to admit, it has some great tracks. And in my honest opinion, the sequel not only was a much better game and fixed many of the issues with the first, but also has a song Night of the Goddess, which is in my top 10 of favorite Final Fantasy tracks. I'm not kidding, I love that song. And I think more people would if, again, it wasn't attached to stigma that was Final Fantasy XIII, which, again, I'm like 10 people that thought the sequel was actually a great game. So Masashi clearly hit his stride, and this could also be my fault. Frontier 1 just had this awesome soundtrack, and these games weren't really meant to be played back to back like this. They were made years apart. But when I played the second Frontier, the first one's soundtrack is still firmly ingrained in my mind. Even now as I try to recall the battle music, it's the first one that I start thinking of. And that's because again, Frontier 1 is just implanted there, so the music is just taking up so much space. Just thinking about it, I have these tunes playing back and forth in my head all day, living rent free. So there's a good chance that there's some great hits in this one, and that I'm just not getting it. But in a replay, I'll be like, dang, I can't believe I missed this, what's wrong with me? But for now, the music is passable. Nothing's wrong with it, but again, nothing that I'm gonna be personally jamming to anytime soon. It's now time to battle, battle, battle. If you saw the last review, you should know that this game uses a similar system, but it does change some things up. First off, you don't get 15 characters to play with like in the first one. Here it's a party of 4 and a reserve unit of 4, which works for the best. I never really went and did more than my main party and felt like the rest were just taking up space. It also sets the tone of the game that fights are scaled back. Even combos and special attacks don't seem as epic as the last game. Here it's more like get in and get out. Heck, many chapters are actually zero battles and just have story itself. Even your LP has been modified to add to this faster sense of battle. 
If you recall, LP basically acts like an extra life. If all your HP is down, you get knocked out and lose 1 LP. Heals to fight more, or each attack on a knocked out character further reduces LP. Once all LP is done, the unit can't fight, and in some cases that character is lost for good. And if your main character loses all LP, it's game over. This time around, LP is a good deal more plentiful. In the last game, it was rare to see someone with double digits. That was usually reserved for robots. Here though, it's pretty commonplace. But the game does balance it out in various ways. First, there are more attacks that directly damage your LP. Secondly, unlike the first game where after battle, you'll be completely restored. Here, your HP is refilled, but not all the way. So you can't just be dancing with death every battle. This is where the third balance comes to play, because the most common way to heal is by using one LP to heal your entire HP. That way you can serve your spells and you heal instantly, as opposed to using a spell which can be risky as the enemy can still attack you and knock you out. Truth be told, I did that more than using spells for most of the game. Healing for the most part is also easier. Arc stones which heal your entire party's WP and SP, I had more of those than I needed near the end of the game as opposed to the first one which you got only two, maybe three? So it's kind of funny, a quicker sense of battle for a game that's actually more story focused. Added to that quicker pace, there's a few more interesting things, such as the fact that you can actually set roles for your characters that affect things like combos, defense, attack, and so on. It's a saga game, so if you didn't know that, it would never actually tell you. But it's on the menu, so it's not like it's hidden hidden, you just gotta go and play with the menu a bit to go ahead and discover it. I didn't actually use it for most of the game, so it's doable, but if you need to go and get a small boost, it can be very useful. So here, it's up to the player to decide how challenging they want to make things. Like the last game, there are different skills. Now instead of just swords and guns, you have axes, swords, pole arms, martial arts, and so on. Unlike the first game, where it took some intuitive thinking to figure out who was best with what, here the game just flat out tells you what weapons and magic works best for plus sign next to them on the character screen. You can always use weapons and magic that you're not a pro at. You'll simply level up slower in that category, and you'll also learn techniques at a slower pace. You won't spark nearly as often. Magic has also been tinkered with this time around. There are no more opposing class. Here you got beast, flame, water, tone, tree, and stone, and there's no more going to mentors now to learn. It's simply combining magic since many of your weapons and armor will have inherent magical properties like Wood Dagger, Beast Bow, and so on. You then go and combine any of those six before to actually craft your spells, and there are some spells only specific people can learn. The thing I really like that this game did is that once you learn a skill, magical or physical, anyone can then instantly use it, instead of the last game where sometimes you get a really great skill, but only for that character. So it's pretty cool, it makes the parties feel like a traveling unit, like, oh hey, here's how you actually go and do that attack. And since it takes place over literal decades, those members are getting older and telling others the nuances of those attacks. Am I putting way too much thought into something Square did just to make the game more player friendly? Probably, but I still really enjoyed it. Before we go more on battles, let's now talk about stats, something every JRPG has. While in the last game you'll randomly level up after battles, here you no longer get stat boosts, simply HP, WP, SP, and then your proficiency in weapons or magic you use. You don't even have to finish fights to go and gain those boosts. Sometimes you'll get the option to spare the enemy, whether it be like, bruh, one of us is going to die, why take that chance? Or the game simply recognizing that you can kill the enemy easily so you spare it, but since you still fought, you still gain bonuses. I always thought it was weird how in most JRPGs you could kill two out of three enemies, flee, and then you would gain absolutely nothing out of it, as if nothing transpired. That's it for the traditional fights, but as I said, there's other forms of battles. The first one being one-on-one -on -one duels. That's right, just you and you alone, mano a mano, or Zombo in this case. In some situations, you can even go and choose to do a one-on-one -on -one battle to conserve health. In your team battles, you might have noticed that under your moves, it says things like charge, focus, and other random words strung together. Well, they aren't random at all. In solo fights, the only way to use those special moves is by stringing those words together to do any spells or skills. This all seems great, though there is one flaw to this, and that's the durability system. As stated, all your weapons have a magical component, and they all have durability. Minus quell weapons that are extremely rare, and steel weapons which have no magic to them. So once they break, you go and get chips, which you can then convert to crowns, which is the currency of this world. Money isn't everywhere though. 
So I hoarded weapons and a lot of times used weaker versions just because I couldn't be so sure I can go and replace it. And not everyone can fight barehanded, so you might be stuck with literally no options. When I first started, I had actually lost around 10 or so hours because I was legitimately all out of weapons. There is an answer to this though, but it's Japan only, with the fabled pocket station. Ah, who knew when I would be able to talk about this thing. So, some of the folks my age might know about the UMD for the Dreamcast. Well, the pocket station was that for the PS1, coming out after the UMD. Many games in Japan used the pocket station, which was basically an add-on for your games. But it was Japan only. So many games like Final Fantasy VIII wisely decided to simply lock out any pocket station quests for their American releases. Frontier 2 didn't, so for someone who doesn't know that, they would see screens that say, Access pocket station here, and just be bewildered as to what to do next. If one was able to actually access it, there are two main uses. The first is getting combos in the pocket station that you can share with friends. That's really cool, I really like old technology like the GPA cables, always trying to get people to play together in these single player experiences. You know, before Wi-Fi was a thing and kind of made it all obsolete. So combos are to the best of my knowledge for the dual mode. And originally you were supposed to go ahead and discover these combos like I did and then share with friends. Who knows, maybe they are incredibly useful, but I beat the game without ever using it. The second, and I would argue more important usage of the pocket station was for a digger minigame, where you set up a time limit and place, and then when it's done, it comes back to you with weapons and armor. This is actually the only way to get the strongest sword within the game. So if I had a Game Shark device, it's locked out. So it really seems like the game was made with the pocket station in mind to compensate for the durability of weapons. The game is doable without the use of the pocket station, you just gotta be a bit smart and frugal with your weapons so you get quell weapons. Again, it's completely doable, but as I said before in my first playthrough, I broke all my weapons and I was broke as a joke. So yeah, pro gamer tip here, don't do that. You won't have to worry about durability with the final type of battles, group battles. Think Fire Emblem, but not anywhere near as good. Basically, you move your troops around to attack the enemy, and you win when you either destroy everyone or you stop the leader. Each unit represents a party, and so long as a party isn't completely wiped out, the troops are replenished. Now, you really only do this three times, and this would be fine, but we gotta talk about the last major battle, the Battle of South Mount, which literally just triggered everyone who's ever played this game. I was like, come on, this can't be that hard. This has to be one of those internet memes, you know, like how now it's cool to pretend that the Pokemon movie had some deep philosophical impact on you because a meme told you about it? It's gotta be that, right? There's no way it can be as difficult as everyone made it out to be. Did I see the true power they all shared deep inside? I see now that the circumstances of one's birth are irrelevant. It is what you do with the gift of life that determines who you are. That's just the internet being the internet, right? Right? Yeah, the internet was sadly right for once. Those posts of people saying they broke their controllers, or it took them more than a day plus, weren't lying. So the first two battles are easy. I would say incredibly easy. I would say so easy they might as well be pointless. So much so you might not discover some of the nuances of these group battles. Like if there's an archer unit close by, as in a space away, they'll actually attack the enemy and do extra damage before you even get some hits in. And if you didn't know that, beating this battle is literally impossible. I don't mean that figuratively, I mean that literally. Basically, these guys up here, they can't be killed. If you try to fight them, you'll just get yourself killed. And this is the first time this happens where you meet an enemy unit that you can't beat, so of course you're not gonna know. You're thinking, well it must be just like those two other times, but no. So of course you're gonna lose your first time around. You're not eased into it at all. To make matters worse, you have to make sure they don't go into your home base. And a home base only exists in this scenario and this scenario only. It's not like say Fire Emblem where each new chapter builds upon previous ones and slowly ratchets it up the difficulty. Here it just comes out of nowhere. It's like, oh yeah dude, there's a base. If the enemy goes there, it's all over. And that only applies here. So your only options are to either beat everyone up which is pretty impossible seeing that there's all those steel units, and again, the only way to possibly beat them is using very esoteric methods that I can never figure out. Beat the main unit, which again, uses some very esoteric methods I can never figure out, or hold out long enough that you automatically gain a win. 
I'm gonna be honest, this took me an entire day, as in I started it, it took me around 6 hours, ended up going to sleep, waking up, and then spending around another 4 hours just to beat it. This is the only part I have ever, ever in any of my reviews used save states, and here it's completely justified. Any strategy I saw said the same thing, do this, but you gotta get lucky. So here's the thing, do this, and hope you get lucky. Beat everyone up, and then just swarm the knights up there and just defend, 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 and stall them. And even then, that took me literal hours of resets, reset, reset. It honestly didn't feel fair. I have nothing wrong with a challenge towards players, and if done right, beating a difficult part can be sweet, validating hours of frustration. But here, the previous two battles were so quick, that this one is just a total curveball that makes the players glad it's over. And that's because the player isn't given a fair shot. It's literally just luck and praying to whatever deity you're currently backing. Since we're already here, we might as well go over the other things I don't particularly enjoy. Something rather neat is the fact that you can meet random people who will go and take equipment from former party members. That way if you went and gave someone a very powerful weapon and they're no longer with you, you're not locked out. The bad thing though is that service is not available in every chapter, so in some chapters you can be locked out of that good weapon. My second and biggest issue is the free scenario system, which is the bread and butter of Saga. It's here and also kinda not here. After progressing in the story you can go back to certain areas you visited before, but that's it, and you can revisit these areas at your whim. Some chapters you can, some chapters you can't. And all you can really do is go ahead and fight monsters, convert some of your items into chips, buy some new items. There is a side quest involving a tower that you can only get by going back to this area, but that's really about it. It's a shame because the beauty of Saga is going where you want. It would be better if the game was like, yeah sure go here to advance the story, but till then do what you want, maybe take on a few side quests. You can alternate between the two stories and at times you do get the option of multiple routes at a time. But I do miss the freedom of Frontier 1, even if I did think it was largely empty freedom. I for sure played games that had the right balance like the PS2 remake Minstrel Song. I dumped so many hours into that and I loved how I could follow the story and then at times just do what I want and take quests in other areas. Frontier 2 feels very linear and restricting at times. If it wasn't a saga game I wouldn't mind, but it does have the weight of being associated with a series that's like, yeah yeah fight an ancient demon but like do what you want we can wait bro. The freedom to go at the plot at your own pace is such a huge part of Saga, and I feel like this is an area that 2 fails at. The way the game advances the plot can also spoil things for the player. See there's a log you can check that shows on a linear timeline what events happen, so you can use this to go and play the game in order. But it might spoil you saying on this day so and so died. Like damn dude I didn't want to know that yet, I wanted to actually play it and be shocked when it happened. This isn't foreshadowing which the game is actually great at, it's just flat out telling you who died and spoiling the story. Which is a strong part of the game most of the time. Speaking of that, I mentioned how some chapters are just story and no battles. Some of them are quite good and have me awaiting each passing minute. And others feel like giant info dumps. And that's because they're around 30 or so characters. 30 playable, much more if you count side characters. And some of these playable characters you only use them for half an hour, maybe less. And some of them had so little impact that even in these info dumps, I had forgotten what level of importance they played to Will and Gustav. There were times I had to google, who is this person? In my own party near the end to get the full picture. Now as is tradition, my last complaint is really nitpicky. Basically early on if you choose Cordelia in a specific mission, she goes and dies. But I like her so you know, time to reset time. And now she lives. Since this was early in the game, I thought it was really leaning into its roots as a story and that with many stories they change over time depending on the region and who's telling it. The start is the same, so is the end, but the middle is malleable, especially because some chapters say things like, Gustav has many legends, and like many legends there's always bits of truth and exaggeration. I thought it was going there, but nah it's really just here this happens. It's nitpicky because characters almost dying and joining your party is commonplace in JRPGs, like Shadow and Final Fantasy VI. Just something I personally would have enjoyed, showing your choices do have an effect, encouraging other playthroughs, but it's fine as it is, again it's super nitpicky. Now as usual, here's where to skip, cause we're about to get to story bits, so if you don't want to be spoiled, head right here. 
I'll give you some time to think about it. Now, with the game being a bit odd and how it progresses in the story, I'll do my best to go ahead and discuss it without being too confusing. And we'll start off first with Gustav. Born as royalty, he is destined to wield the Firebrand, a Fire Quell Sword, but he fails having no anima and is deemed as useless. The prince, now less than a pauper, he, his mother, and his teacher seek refuge in another land. His family torn apart, with even one of his siblings cursing his existence. Unable to wield anima, he instead focuses on steel materials, making a sword of such. Growing in age and after the death of his mother, he decides that he has to make his own place in the world. He begins to use his status as a forgotten prince who is worthless to his advantage. Taking control of a kingdom as his base of operations, he begins his quest to unite the lands. Making his own capital in Han Nova, the player actually gets to decide what to build where, and that decision actually comes into play years later. With this going well, he reconnects with his brother who initially blamed him for his mother's death, and his sister, allowing her to divorce a rival lord that she married for political reasons and allow her to marry Kelvin. As a sign of goodwill, he allows his brother's son to wield the firebrand, making him successor to the throne. Sadly though, his nephew is killed by an assassin during the precision, and Gustav's brother, in rage, wields the firebrand, turning into a dragon. That's going to be super important later on. Gustav continues his campaign until he dies. His body is never found, but all that was left was his sword. His death shifts the balance of powers throughout the lands that the Lord of Cancel and Elders try to fill as they begin proxy wars to conquer Gustav's territory. He even attacks Gustav's capital, Han Nova, where we discover Kelvin named one of his children Philip III in honor of the young slain prince. Maybe it's for this reason that the dragon returned to save what he can of Gustav's forces. Though he's actually able to gain most of Gustav's territories, with Cantal's death, his lands are splintered between his many children. With no sole force to unite behind, it seems a power gap has simply grown as the years have gone on, and many have even taken on the name Gustav, claiming to be his son or grandson in an effort to get some of that valor for themselves. It's clear that it's a name that brings honor and horror to many as time has passed on. A man seeing this decides to go and be a fake Gustav, and I hate this. Not the story, I actually like it quite a lot, but don't ruin it, we never saw Gustav's body. So you can for sure play into it, is this Gustav? What happened? How does he now know Anima? Is it a fake? Is it him resurrected? Is he a monster? Instead of just revealing he's a fake. Anyway, the fake is getting many people on his side. Some folks like Sargon serving out of fear after fake Gustav sets up a trap to kill his partners. Fake Gustav is now conquering the world. Just the fear of Gustav convinces the countries to finally work together and drive him back. Ironically, a man who was intent on conquering all is what made peace finally happen. David, Kelvin's grandson, leading this charge. Fulfilling Kelvin and Gustav's wish and even noting that though Gustav may be a being some detest, he refused to let the idea of his birth dictate his life. Born without anima, his title stripped, he scratched tooth and nail to cement a place in this world and a legacy that will last forever. Our second campaign will be that of Will Knights. After getting a quell, he decides to find out what really happened to his parents. His on agreeing, they go in tow to the town of Grugel and learn his father was last seen in a megalith to the south. Before we get there, I like how there's this girl here. She's clearly saying the word yet, but stretching it out. But I want to pretend that Square invented the word yeet. So that's what we're gonna go with. Towards the megalith, you learn his father and some friends discovered a quell some kind of egg that led to his and some other travelers' deaths. I gotta say, this part is hilarious because it's one of those JRPG things where everyone in town says a specific part of the story. Like, do they go and practice that? Okay, Jim, remember your lines in case the son of a man returns so we can reveal his tragic backstory. You got that? Okay, break on five. Let's go. Anyway, here we learn his father teamed up with a group called the Sergen Brothers in an expedition, and something happened that caused two of the brothers to die or go insane with Will's father stopping it. With one brother remaining named Lexi, he's the last remaining link. Joining his party, you then get into a pretty cool part, a town filled with liars who don't trust outsiders, as you try and find the quell. Alexei then reveals he always knew who Will was and tries to lie to him that his mother killed his father. 
The shock causes Will to pass out before he awakens and confronts Alexei. Now having the quell that killed his brothers declaring it can go and control monsters, he, well, summons dragons. This is another part I didn't really enjoy. I ended up doing it so late in the game because I didn't have Will's on the party and you need her because what happens is that you lose and she attacks and kills the dragons for you and then you go and fight the real boss. If you don't have her, well you just lose. You beat Alexei and he and the egg falls into the mine. Will's aunt dies and he now senses the egg, knowing it's still around and that it has to be defeated. During his travels he makes it to the snowy lands of Weissland and discovers another megalith like the one the egg was stored in. One of his companions is corrupted by a quell there and becomes a monster, just like Gustav's brother. Again, this game can be great at times with parallel storytelling. Though this monster, unlike the dragon, is not benevolent. It will chase their party down to kill them. Eventually escaping, Will becomes rich and hears about the egg held by the people of the Anima faith. A religious order that believes those who don't wield Anima are less than human and some think they deserve death. Well, Gustav attacks their compound because a member of their faith was the person who killed his nephew. It's just so funny how fast they change their tune from Those who can use Anima are trash. Should they even deserve to live? To But we were so peaceful. Why are you attacking us? Say what you want about Magneto, but he never pretends to be shocked when the Sentinels come marching in. Will is fortunately able to escape and senses that someone escaped with the egg. So he runs after it to the seaside town. He sneaks on a boat while Gustav teams up with Will's team to protect the town, since the one who holds the egg can summon and control monsters. Will defeats the wielder as the boat goes down with him still on it, Will hoping that the egg will disappear beneath the waves. Fast forward to a few years later and you now play as Rich Knights, a bit of a playboy, and I do mean that. One of his quests is legit just trying to get him laid. Some girl is like, I want to see a rainbow, and he's like, don't worry baby, I got you. In between trying to pick up ladies, he's also being trained by one of his father's old friends. He seems fine with his life until he senses it, the egg. Confronting Will and confirming he survived the boat, Will says the wielder of the egg must also die. Rich tries to find another way as he investigates a plague and discovers it was caused by the egg. It's absorbing the anima of others making them sick and die. Making the mother of his child go to his father's home, Rich tries to stop the egg. He kills the wielder knowing there's no other way and he himself dies, another victim of the egg. Another time skip and now you're playing as Virginia Knights, or Ginny Knights, Will's granddaughter. After stowing on a ship and getting away from some pirates, by the way, these pirates are hilarious. Yeah, I know it's a till and it has other uses like approximations, but I'm a filthy weave. So to me, it seems like he's now an anime schoolgirl. Yes, Captain Son, I'll do better. So next time, notice me. After fleeing the schoolgirl pirates, she meets Primaria, Roberto, and a man named Gustav, who has a blade that looks just like the Firebrand and Gustav's sword. But he's so much younger. Could it be him? Another pretender? We'll just have to see. The party goes on more quests before reaching the Insect Megalith where Rich met his end and Ginny discovers her dad's possessions and realizes her father has passed on and cries. Finally learning of his fate, Will reveals what he knows about the egg and after visiting a friend reveals that the fake Gustav is in possession of the egg. And that's the reason for his dream. The reason he was able to conquer these lands so quickly. Reaching South Mount and thankfully not fighting, it's revealed that Gustav is actually Philip III Kelvin's son and the rightful heir to the throne. But he's fine with it as is, preferring to travel and go on adventures while his nephew handles the country. With sword and toe, you then go to the last megalith. Yeah, and if you went straight there and didn't level up at all, you might have some issues. This place is pretty tough. You see monsters here who are very similar to beasts from humans who had their anima overloaded. Here is the final showdown with the egg, and this can be as easy or difficult as you want. Throughout the Megalith you meet various monsters of the different magical classes. Water, fire, beast, stone, tone, and tree. You can beat four of those bosses and remove those affinities from the egg, weakening it and reducing how many different attacks it can have. The water and fire bosses must be fought as a team. The others are one on one. Pro tip, unless you have anti-stone protection for everyone, which you probably don't, beat the stone boss or you'll be insta-killed by the egg. We also learn something interesting here. Sargon reveals what a quell is. It's actually a strong-willed individual who has passed away, goes to the past to are now in weapon form, refusing to pass on and have their anima join with the earth. Sargon can leave and fights the party. 
Another boss reveals those Middle Knights in the Battle of South Mound, they are now the beasts that protect the egg. Finally confronting the egg, it ascends, its anima enough to cover a planet and taking the shape of a god. We know quells are beings of the past, so who or what is the egg? A powerful being? Some kind of demon? All it knows how to do is hurt others as it attempts to breach through. So the Knight family fulfills its generations long goal of fighting it. After beating it, the egg remains now massively engorged as Gustav's sword, the one he forged decades ago, slashes the egg. Since the start, we were told steel resists anima, but it seems not even Gustav's sword works as it breaks. But soon, so does the egg. Felled by a family it tormented for generations, and destroyed by the blade of a man who was deemed worthless at birth. An enemy that stalked mankind, gone for good, as the anima of those it had stolen, able to return and rejoin the cycle of life, including the members of the Knight's family. Truthfully, I was happy with just a simple explanation of the egg. I assumed the egg was just one powerful being or a bunch of them, since Sargon reveals what quells are. Well, according to the Ultimania strategy guide though, the egg is actually the spirits of an entire ancient civilization, putting themselves in the egg to survive some kind of disaster. Now they plan to replace all the beings who now exist. It's even hinted that they nurtured the anima of people to eventually replace them, similar to Legends 2 and the creators who reside in Elysium. So the egg is in effect mankind's oldest enemy, seeing the humans of Frontier 2 as nothing more than father for its ascension. And it's ironic that their downfall is due in part to a man whose family was lost to revive them, and another man who had no anima to cultivate. After beating the game, you can do a sort of new game plus. You're now able to pick any chapter you want, and you can even jump straight into fighting the egg itself. But you fight it with your current level, so it'll just kick your butt, so I don't know why you would do that. And now it comes to this. Is it better than Frontier 1? Well, at this point, it's kind of comparing apples to oranges, or well, more like apples to alligators. These games are so completely different, the only thing they share is a level up system and a name. That's it. They might as well not come from the same franchise. Frontier 1 was so much more ambitious, having a plethora of characters to choose from, and again, different genres of stories. But some of those stories were less than stellar. I'm looking at you, Acellus and Loot. And no, I have not played the remaster, as I'm recording this, it's a week from being released. So there are things I liked about Frontier 1, but some things I felt hampered the overall experience. For Frontier 2, I feel much the same way. It has great things about it, but the almost complete removal of the free scenario system is something that just left a bad taste in my mouth. But what helped was that grand narrative. And though you play each story at your own pace, I recommend doing it the way I did it, alternating between Will and Gustav. Because again, the game is actually great when it comes to parallel storytelling. Along with that, unlike Frontier 1 where it left so many questions and I was like, why is this happening? Frontier 2 gives just enough that you can be satisfied, but you can dig deeper for treasure. So yes, Frontier 1 in my personal experience had more fun battles. But 2 is better in its story and the character it focuses on. They each have goods and bads, but by the end of the day, the goods outweigh the bad by a mile. So if you're looking for a classic RPG with some pretty good battle mechanics and you enjoyed Frontier 1, then Frontier 2 is well worth the effort. While not as long as 1, you can expect to play around 50-75 to 75 hours or so on it, so it's a pretty meaty title. Just a pro tip, it's an old school RPG so keep an extra save file or two, cause there were some times I was on thin ice. It can really only be emulated, but with the release of Frontier 1 Remastered, I don't see why Frontier 2 won't get the same treatment somewhere down the line. So you can either wait for it or play it any way you can, cause this is a classic PSRPG. So if you're into those and you haven't tried this one yet, give it a shot. I'm sure you'll love it just as much as I did. Well guys, gals, and those in between, I do hope you enjoyed this latest video. This channel has grown, partially due to luck, but for those who comment, I love hearing what you have to say, especially if you had a different experience than I did. Anyway, here are some older vids. The next video is going to be something different. We're going to be talking about Animu for two reasons. One, I do like to change things up every now and then, keep it fresh, and it'll also let me get footage for the next game we talk about. So after my filthy weep side gets unleashed, it's going to be right back to games, and the effect is going to be fearful. Uh, that was... that, that was pretty lame. <laughs> anyway, here are the socials that you can follow, a Patreon, no goals yet, but soon. Hope you've seen the improvements and appreciate it. 
I thank everyone who likes, comments, and subscribes. Anything that shows your support really is just the best, and I would appreciate it if you did it for this video. Till then guys, gals, and those in between, catch you next time, have a blessed day.